I would like to thank Wexford Art Centre and Belkana for giving me the opportunity um, for holding this online printmaking demonstration and artist talk. It's part of the Belkana at Home 2020 programme and um, I'd like to also thank all of you for taking the time, time out to join me today uh, for the one and a half hours. As Lisa has said, my name is Deirdre Meehan Buttmer and I'm a visual artist and I'm learning new skills during the um, lockdown and one of those is trying to learn how to become a fringe trimmer. I'm not sure how successful that, that has turned out. I leave that to your judgment. I would have loved to have stayed with the original plan, which was to actually do, do this live in Wexford Arts Centre. But I'm really so grateful that uh, there is an opportunity to do this in an alternative way. I would have hated the whole thing to have been cancelled because of this, this very difficult and challenging situation that's facing all of us and our families and friends and communities. So it's fantastic to have the opportunity to go ahead with this. And actually, ironically, one of the benefits of doing it this way is that it has allowed us to reach out to a broader community um, across the country rather than uh, probably having been, been, been more limited to people with easy access to the Wexford Arts Centre. So I'm very, very grateful for that. I'm quite excited about it. So um, I just wanted to explain, first of all, that my Wi-Fi at home here is not exactly the most reliable and in fact in good weather i'm not quite sure why but in good weather it has uh, an even poorer quality i felt that with an hour and a half session it was way too risky to rely on being able to maintain um, that wi-fi through the artist talk the discussion of materials the and the live demonstration as well so what I've done is I have pre-recorded a number of different sections and parts of the hour and a half um, so that we, we should, will be able to manage no matter what happens, the, the Wi-Fi. Um, the other thing is that uh, I, in doing this, and as I say, I would actually have loved to do it live because certainly for me, that's one of the things that I love in my art practice. I love engaging with people and getting the feedback and being able to react to how people are reacting uh, to me and what I'm saying and doing. So unfortunately, obviously, I don't have that today, but I would like to interact as much as possible. So I will keep, keep trying to switch between the pre-recorded stuff and Zoom. For questions and any comments that you have, I really, really would appreciate it. Um, and I genuinely mean that. It's not just kind of saying it for the sake of it. Because to me, that's how I learn, that's how my practice grows, it's how I get a buzz, continue to get a buzz out of doing it. Um, it's Sessions are never the same, they're always different depending on, on how participants respond. So if you're okay with it, because of the, the media that we're using, the pre-recorded and the Zoom, the best thing is probably to leave that to the end of the session, but we'll make sure that we allow sufficient time for that. So if you have any ideas or thoughts or questions as we go along, maybe you might just drop them down and we'll address, hopefully get a chance to address all of them or as many as possible before the end of the session. The technique that I'm going to be demonstrating in the latter part of our session today is, has been described well as a, a lot of people, including Catherine Bow from the Art Centre and people like Eamon Maxwell who have helped to mentor me um, in the last year or so, as quite experimental. Um, it combines a mixture of print and what I call, or what it's called, mark making. And um, I'll get into that as, as we progress through the, the session today. I've employed this approach in studio work, collaborative studio work, and community projects and workshops and school residencies, um, and particularly in, in community projects and residencies. And in the last nine months, it has evolved to another kind of stage, which is incorporating um, things like thread, stitching, collage, um, with stitching, doing a stitch called couching, which actually allows you to do things like um, add materials, raised 3D materials to your printed surface and incorporate them into it. 
So what I'd like to do now is to actually show you a couple of examples of that type of work, um, just to give you a feel for what we're going to be getting into at the end of the session. And then I'll go back and look at some of the other aspects I've been asked to cover off by Bialkna and the Art Centre. So the first piece I'd like to show you is actually um, a photograph of a, of a work, and I apologise, I don't actually have the original available. Um, sorry, wrong way around. Um, but what I would like to do is to show this to you as an example of the initial um, piece of work that we're going to be looking at. This is a uh, monotype print. And monotype um, really means that you just get one print normally, just one print off a piece, a plate that you have prepared. It's not like doing etching, where once you have actually etched into the surface of a plate, something like this, um, that you can keep repeating, taking the same prints by just inking up your, uh, your etched surface and putting paper on it, putting it through a press and getting a continuous series of, of prints. With these, once you actually take your print, um, that you, you obviously you have you have affected the surface that you are actually that you you have prepared. And therefore if you actually on your plate take another print, what you get is actually what's called a ghost print because the surface has changed. It's not the original full body of ink that you originally took your print from. You've removed an awful lot of it because it's on the surface of the plate and therefore it's a ghost print. It's, it, it's what, what actually remains from the original print that was taken. In a strange way, the ghost print can sometimes be even more effective than the original print. And it's something, again, I can show you a little bit more of later on or show you examples from um, workshops that we've had particularly some of the adults workshops where the ghost prints have been incredibly effective and in fact at various stages we didn't care what the original print was going to be we were aiming and working towards ghost prints as being the actual pieces we wanted to produce so that's the first type um what it actually does here as well it allows us to incorporate color on top of the black ink in a very simple manner and the way that this is done is by using a slightly different surface. In this instance I used a little piece of um, embossed raised uh, wallpaper and um, I just tore a shape out. I wasn't trying to recreate anything in particular, I was just trying to pick a piece, a shape that I thought would be attractive or nice to have, have in a piece. And what I did was I took that piece of paper aside and rolled it up with uh, red ink rather than black ink. So the original plate had black, black ink all over it. I did some mark making with different types of tools to actually remove the black ink here. Uh, different methods of, of producing quite a 3D type effect. This is an instrument that's um, incredibly useful uh, for doing angled removal, removal of ink. And as I say, it can produce quite a three-dimensional effect. And um, lay the piece of paper, the embossed piece of wallpaper down on top of it. And then on the plate, just put my piece of paper down for printing and rolled it. So that's one type, and um, that's a, a monotype. It's almost monochrome, but we've introduced some colour into it in, in, pla in places. So I'll just put that piece aside. This one here is slightly different. I actually still have the original um, piece here, the original um, uh, piece of work that was produced. And this one here was basically the same initial technique as in we used a, I used a, um, a plate and actually I mixed the inks, I mixed the combinations of yellow and blue with a little bit of white and black to produce different greens, lighter and darker, and almost um, greys coming out in some instances. This one here, um, I also then incorporated some of the um, thread ink materials on top of it. So the easiest thing to do possibly is if I just bring it over closer to the camera, um, it might, might feel a little bit strange, but just to show you the surfaces that have actually been um, produced because of the methods used. So this bit here, 
just to show you a little bit more on the light. Um, it's on the um, left hand side, in your left hand side, there is lace attached. So it's a little bit of lace just cut out and stitched into it very, very simply, just with invisible stitching or more or less invisible stitching. On this side over here, if I can just bring it a little bit closer, we actually have a reed, a grass reed, which has been couch stitched onto the surface. And even after it's just showing the bottom, it even just runs over the edge a little piece and just up here. And uh, I suppose really um, the secret to this and the reason we're able to actually stitch into it as well as print ink on it is I have found this incredibly versatile material, which is basically a paper tablecloth. It's a linen effect paper tablecloth. And I have found it to be a fantastic, absolutely fantastic surface um, to incorporate work on. Uh, it's inexpensive, incredibly versatile. Um, it's actually huge when you take the piece out initially. It's 190 by 125 centimeters. And in fact, that piece, that size, was uh, what I used for my graduate show. I had uh, three pieces hanging. Um, in an installation alongside a, uh, an artist book and it was quite effective. So as I say this has become my thing and my only challenge at the moment is I'm having huge difficulty actually sourcing them. The original uh, supermarket chain that I was buying them in no longer uh, sources them so I'm trying to get to the manufacturer to see if I can actually get them direct from Germany. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to just take a, a little cut at this stage and then I'm going to move on to telling you what we are going to be covering in the hour and a half and then getting into some of the other sections. So I'll be back shortly. The next part, um, I, just, I suppose what I'd just like to say to you is that what I'm going to cover in the hour and a half to give you a feel for it, I'm going to give a short personal background, which I've been asked to do by the Art Centre and Bielkna, and I think partly because I took up art quite late in life, and I think it's something they just wanted me to kind of share with people. I'll give you an overview of my art practice. Again, I'm not going to spend too much time on it, but I'd like to discuss two different two particular projects which I think people might find interesting. The first is the Living Arts Residency, where I was lead artist in 2019-2020 in Denard National School. The overall theme was biodiversity and we titled it In Our Backyard. Initially, I introduced the children to the print mark making and then we also create, used air drawing clay to make um, creatures basically from their imaginations and the towards the end of the residency we focused a lot on land art which was incredibly enjoyable. And the second was the Creative Communities Women's Refuge project and subsequent exhibition on course of control in 2019. This is the poster I designed with the women's group um, to advertise the exhibition on coercive control, which was held during the 16 days of action opposing violence against women. And also uh, just a shot of inside the exhibition space. The work is a mixture of um, ink and um, prints, photographs, sculpture, installations, and uh, I'll go into that a little bit more later. And that's become really, really interesting because it's turned into an action group, which I've actually become part of. And uh, we're now looking at new ways of communicating information around coercive control and the broader domestic violence issues, particularly in the climate we're living in with lockdown. I'll then move on to the practical demonstration. I'd like to go through with you um, the materials I use. I use quite inexpensive. Um, simple materials at the moment, primarily because of the volumes involved, um, but also in working with children, um, it's a lot easier to use water-based inks than um, than others or than oil-based inks. Um, that it's not totally washable, but it's a, a lot more washable uh, than the oil-based inks are. So that's one of the reasons. It's also very 
simple and quick to use in workshops when you're trying to get the maximum amount of activity out of the time that's available to you. After that, then I'll go straight into questions and comments. And I really would be interested in hearing your views, um, what you liked, what you didn't like, what, what you think there might be more potential in. My art practice is experimental in nature and it's really driven by my intuition um, and curious approach to things. Um, when I look at the surfaces and materials, I'm always interested in how they would react to each other. So I use non-standard materials and surfaces a lot. This is a good example of it. It's a mixed media portrait of my grandniece Ava uh, from 2016. It was very spontaneous and um, they had just Facebooked me a photo of her and I literally just grabbed what was on the table and, and drew from the, from the photo. So I used tracing paper and I drew with nail varnish, tip X, inks, a pen, oil pastels and charcoal and graphite. Uh, luckily for me, her parents are very open-minded art-wise and they loved it and it looks really well framed in their hallway. Along with drawing, um, there's also a strong photographic element to my work. I like to frame things and zoom in, often totally abstract, abstracting the, the subject photographed. This is an A3 digital print from 2018. It's a dilapidated garden shed taken over by ivy with sun streaming through. I also enjoy using macro lenses. I did a series in 2015 um, used photographing rock buds on St. Helens Beach. This is rock bud one at an A2 digital print that's 42 by 59 centimeters. A lot of people think it looks like a creature in flight. This one is entitled Friends. It's from 2015 again. It's an A5 or 14.8 by 21 centimeter digital print. I zoomed into what really interests me. Um, I really feel it says a lot more than having taken full portraits. As part of my graduate show in 2016, I produced an artist book, which was based on a series of photographs um, using different surfaces. And I also included text. The title was Temporary Gathering of Strangers, and it was really about isolation in possibly unexpected places or in unexpected ways. I'm really interested in the idea that somebody can be in a crowd but be totally alone. Um, I was helped to understand at the time that it showed an indexical nature in my work which I learned to understand that the, the meaning of what I'm doing is dependent on the con context within which it is used. So these photographs by themselves might meet, mean one thing, but when put together with the specific text, it takes on a, a whole new meaning. And the first photograph that I've shown there is a derelict window started the whole process. And um, this is the text that's associated with it. And it is in the following photograph, the text is from Collective Culture and Urban Public Space. And again, to try and take away too much control from the overall process and from the meaning, I just used every tenth word, tenth word in the text. I mentioned earlier um, in my talk about my favourite paper, tablecloth surface. This is Indian inks and Tipex on one of them. Um, it was drawn with a house paintbrush on my finger and mark making using the back of wall tiles. This is part of my using everyday objects as mark making tools approach. And to me, it kind of strips away any distinction or line in the sand between my life and my art practice. Give you a little bit of my personal background. Um, I am originally from Dublin um, and I've been living in Wexford for about 30 years. Initially it was sort of part time, uh, but I've been permanently here for six years. I understand that still makes me a blow in, but I do my best. I spent 30 plus years working in financial services. 
but it was kind of strange because I never actually did finance. Um, so I'm no better than anybody else who balanced me with the check stubs. Um, the kind of work that I did was I've done training, coaching, team leading, mentoring, some operations work. I've done a lot of project management and a lot of change management, which is probably my favorite work. Throughout my career, I had um, I had experience, a lot of experience with facilitation and as I say, mentoring and things like that. And in particular, facilitation when I was leading the change management unit, I had the opportunity to work with senior executives who were sponsors of change within the organization. And really it was to help them understand the natural reaction to change. We can have this kind of contradictory thing as leaders or team leaders where we've had an opportunity to understand why a change is necessary and what the benefits are of doing it and the consequences are of not doing it. We kind of expect then or we can expect that because we've seen the light that everybody who comes along and hears the news after that should also equally see the light and human nature is not like that. So if you really want the change to be fully implemented, fully uh, taken on board, um, you really, really need to give people the opportunity to get their heads around it. Uh, it doesn't mean you have to spend extra months doing it, but you have to consistently throughout your project understand that you have to include the human side of change along with all the other IT and promotion and all of those other things that have to happen. So I would be explaining, have explaining to people that they should be relieved to hear people question it and give out about it and look at it from a personal perspective and get their heads around what it is. Uh, it, that is far more preferable for, to give people the opportunity to work through that than to have people say nothing and just bitch about it and or be yes men, yes women and not really be convinced, just tell you what you want to hear. I workshopped over, I, well, when I look back at it, I worked up over a thousand individuals within my own organisation and within partner organisations that they were doing change projects with at various stages, strategic partners. And it was really to help identify the barriers to change and what would help people accept and ultimately live the change. Um, it also included scheduling the human side of change within, within the overall um, project our program uh, plans which I also facilitated so the human side of change element would be issues identification involvement two-way communication all of those things and again looking at the personal impact of change the individuals not just the good of the for the organization the shareholders the customers I began my formal visual arts training uh, in Southcar College in Wexford in 2008-2009 um, that, that, that year. Following that, I had to return to work intermittently um, and that really extended my four years degree uh, programme. But I graduated uh, from Wexford School of Art and Design, IT Carlo, in 2016 with a very, thankfully, uh, gained first class honours degree. Um, since then, I've availed of the opportunity to build what Catherine um, and some others have kindly uh, described as a strong participatory art practice. And it's included at the start doing assistant artist roles, quite rightly build your skills um, from the ground up. And uh, I found very quickly that although I had a huge amount of facilitation skill, for example, from my previous life, that did not automatically translate to 16, four to six year olds, um, keeping them facilitated and entertained. So yes, hands-on experience was ex extremely important. Uh, Making bees masks and mixed media bees at Little Artists Club, Little Artists Club Summer Camp, Storytown, and Creative Arts Club, Summer Camp, Storytown again for the older children.
and now shark is mom. And dad just kept quiet. <laughs> Any assistant artist roles, uh, I undertook quite a lot of research um, and design into developing children's art workshops for Wexford Art Centre, the Little Artists Club, and also the Saturday Arts Club, which is the 7 to 12 year olds. Um, I used the school curriculum uh, to help me understand what they should be, we should be trying to get them, trying to help them with in terms of their, their art de development and their understanding and their appreciation and all of those things um, at, at what age. The other thing that we've incorporated, uh, myself and fellow ar artist Jenny Roddy, we alternate classes. Um, the other thing we, we incorporate very strongly into everything we do with children is visual thinking strategy. And it's very much around helping them ask the open questions, uh, sorry, asking the open questions of them to help them get their heads around what's actually happening in a piece of work. So it's questions like, uh, what do you see in the painting? What do you think is happening? Um, what do you think the artist meant when they did that? How do you think the person in the image feels? What makes you say that? So it's very much around getting them to look and examine it and come up with their own understanding, their own perception, their own thinking around what that piece of art is all about. And that's, that's a, a, a real honour to be in a position to be able to do that. So we used to say we do the children's Saturday, some of the children's Saturday art workshops, which are now moving online. And um, Easter, Easter and summer camps we've done in the past. I also spent a lot of time developing um, adults print uh, mark making workshops initially based on the five ways to draw the things which is the, the core component of what I'm going to be showing, be showing you today and I think I found with the adults workshops that they gave they give me a lot of um, fulfillment in a different way to working with children because you're working very much with your your peers, you're working with people that you can learn an awful lot from, not that you don't learn from the children, but there's like an exchange of um, information. And at the end of the sessions, at the end, particularly at the end of the last course, which was a set of six, and we had some people who were consistently there all the way through, um, myself and uh, fellow artist Breed, who was, who was really kindly helping me with the sessions, we really discovered we were learning nearly more from the participants at the end than we were showing them. We showed them the basics, the skills, the ideas, it evolved. But they were putting the, these ideas together in ways we had never even thought of. So it's, to me, that's the true um, enjoyment of collaborative work. I'd just like to show you some output um, from the adults' workshops. The first I, one there is where one of the participants did a drawing through the back of paper onto an inked plate. Um, I think it's something quite, quite beautiful about it. The second one is um, just mark making with feathers on linen and um, using little bits of color, dipped color. Um, the third one is just a really, really beautiful um, two prints done on the one page. Um, using a combination of mark making and um, wipe out. The next two uh, are the plate that was used um, um, showing the various raised surfaces uh, that were rolled different colors or painted different colors and the following one is the print that uh, came off that. It's a little bit faded, um, not quite vibrant enough, but it's, I think it's still very beautiful. I think it was just that it, um, the ink had dried too much by the time the print was, was actually taken. Um, the next two are again the plate and the print. Um, but in this instance, rather than using the um, plastic plate and uh, placing items on it, this was actually done using the cutout foam. And again, you can draw your pattern, your design on it, um, cut the, the, the various, the different shapes out, which allows you, if you want to, allows you then to do them, ink them different colors. Um, in this instance, 
um, the artist didn't, the participant, uh, she left it, but in, in subsequent prints, she actually did them different colours. The next one is just showing you where uh, one of the workshop participants had uh, done a monochrome print, and this is on the paper tablecloth, and she's just about to start uh, doing some stitching and collage onto it. And the last one here is, I think, just a very beautiful example of the combination of print and stitching, um, wool, um, and um, that whole approach in terms of bringing two different media together to create something quite unique. Amongst other projects that I've been involved in, I was recently lead artist with the Living Arts Project, which is an arts and education initiative run by Wexford County Council and Wexford Arts Centre and the participating um, national schools, primary schools. In 2019, um, I was also awarded, as I say, the Creative Communities Award by Wexford County Council to want to take a project with Wexford Women's Refuge, exploring breast control. And I'll give you an overview of that project shortly. In 19, I was awarded one of the Creative Communities grants um, from Wexford County Council Arts Office to run a project with Wexford Women's Refuge. The context for the project was that Ireland had introduced the Domestic Violence DV Act on the 1st of January 2019 and that created a new offence called coercive control. Women's Aid Ireland defined coercive control as a persistent pattern of controlling, coercive and threatening behaviour including all or some form of domestic abuse, emotional, physical, financial, sexual, including threats by a boyfriend, partner, husband or ex. It traps women in a relationship and makes it impossible or dangerous to leave. This can have a serious impact, including the fear of violence, cause serious alarm and distress, and can result in a woman giving up work, changing her routines, losing contact with family and friends. Coercive control can damage a woman's physical and emotional well-being. So the project, um, basically we created a body of work which was developed by women who were targets of coercive control and who had accessed Wexford's Women's Refuge or their outreach services. As I say, it was part of the Creative Communities Programme and the objective was to empower participants to use their personal experiences to describe course of control and share it in a manner that triggered public debate and understanding. As the facilitator, I uh, worked with participants to tell their stories in an anonymous way, drawing on things like phrases that resonated with them, e.g. shouted words, voicemails, texts from abusers and even whispered words. Words extracted from their journal entries, many women in these situations do keep journals and are able to go back and look at situations, incidents and share them. Some had everyday images or possessions that helped to tell their stories and helped explain to other people what it was like to be in a course of control situation. And also, we looked at descriptions of how it feels when you as a target recognise the abuse and begin your journey back to yourself. The body of work produced between May and October 2019 included prints, digital photographic prints, mixed media, audio, other installations and journals, which viewers were invited and encouraged to read. We made people aware that the ex exhibition contains sensitive content, which some people might have found upsetting, and we did advise that viewer discretion was advised. The aim of the exhibition has always been to broaden the awareness of what coercive control is and how it impacts on women and children. And the women who participated in the project understood the importance of getting their voices heard and reaching out to others to encourage and empower them to access supports and services. This group of women, who I'm very proud to say I'm now a member of, have 
followed on from the exhibition when it was completed at the end of the 16 days of action in December 2019. We have formed an action group. We very much want to be advocates for people who are in the still in course of control or broader domestic violence situations. One of the things we're looking at doing is restating the exhibition in another Main Street location in Wexford Town. We're aware that although many hundreds of people came through the exhibition when it was staged in 2019, there's a huge um, body of people who would not have known where the creative hub was, who don't walk through from Mallon Street to Main Street. And although it was a beautiful location to have it, we really feel we need somewhere more accessible, somewhere on the Main Street, somewhere where a woman can drop in and find like-minded people that she can talk to. The other thing we're doing is developing podcasts and other electronic audio pieces, again, to help women who are in these situations see that there is light at the end of the tunnel. And that these women who have been through absolutely horrendous domestic situations have come through the other end and are well and absolutely determined to help other women. Hi to everyone again there. Um, hi Deirdre, are you still with us? Yeah, hi Lisa, thank hi. you so much again for playing the videos for me, I really appreciate it. That's no problem, yeah, glad it went well. Yeah, I think um, at this stage I should probably close off the share screen, yeah. Can you see um, anything on my, uh, am I sharing anything right now? Uh, no, it's no. just yeah, no, you people. shouldn't see anything. Yeah, I can um can anybody else confirm that they can't see the video anymore? <laughs> and you can see Deirdre. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Cool. <laughs> um, I'll leave my gallery so I can see people as well, if that's okay. And mm -hmm. um, what I want to do is first of all thank you for bearing with the video. Um, my biggest concern as I say was the Wi-Fi, and I've actually moved in, moved to a friend's house to do it because my Wi-Fi was no longer bad, it had almost 100% disappeared. So I'm really glad that we did do some pre-prepared stuff. I know it's not the same as doing it live, but I just didn't want to let people down and have technology kill it. So what I want to do is we've about 45 minutes. Um, I want to leave a couple of minutes at the end, obviously, for any questions or queries and things. But I'd like to share with you kind of the basics of the tools that I use for the print and mark making. Some of you could be experienced printers and apologies if I go and look at stuff you learned years ago, but I have to kind of make the assumption that people are starting from different levels. And the other thing is that I suppose I've learned that the way I use the tools and things, none of it is new. I don't think as artists any of us really invent anything new, but we might do it slightly differently. Um, the other thing I've been told by a couple of very experienced artists, way more experienced than me, is that they have found going to some of my workshops helps them stop overthinking things a bit and maybe helps them be a little bit more spontaneous. So that's kind of what I offer, I hope. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to do a mixture of kind of standing up closer to it and going back over to the, the art supplies table. Um, I keep mentioning through the talks and discussions that I'm really into using everyday objects and it took me a long time to kind of work out why but I was lucky enough when I was in college that I kind of tripped onto it and it's all to do with this thing called ethnography which I learned about in college and basically it's looking at trying to understand society and people by looking at the things they use every day rather than looking at things that are written about them or documented about them or whatever. And it was an ethnographer called Henry Glassman, who um, I had the opportunity to study a little bit. And I was actually looking up to meet him at a book meeting in Carolyn Channel. And uh, he spent a huge amount of time in Ireland. He's an American, but he had this thing where he used to go and almost live, live with people, live in tiny villages and things to understand the history and the current reality of people by looking at things that I, they use every day. So by accident, I was doing that. And then I kind of started to understand a little bit more in college about why I was doing it. And I bring that to everything that I do. 
So what I want to do is just show you first of all some of the instruments of torture, which is probably the best way to describe it. Is. <laughs> uh, that's what you get. Alisa, you might tell me if that they're kind of visible to people. Yeah, I can see those, Deirdre. Okay. Yeah. Sorry about that, my Zoom screen decided to disappear. <laughs> okay, so just to give you a feel for them. Pencil, earbud, these two here are instruments that are normally used with air drying clay, but they are great tools for, uh, one of them has a ridged edge, and they're fantastic tools for working into ink and actually getting textured surfaces or swirling surfaces. Again, this is another one that's used normally with air drying clay. And for some reason, my Zoom screen keeps disappearing. Okay. And um, those here are just plastic palettes. And the, again, they're slightly different edges. They're very useful for getting three dimensional effects. Even basic things like plastic forks, toothbrush, and a little bit of paintbrush. I think Lisa, for some reason, my screen is... Oh, we can still see you, Deirdre, as far as I'm aware. So um, there isn't an issue with, with us seeing okay. you. Okay, I keep going there. Keep going, yeah. Yeah, it kind of disappears to me a little bit, but that's fine. I don't need to continue. And um, these are the components that I use for, for two different things. They are used as palettes for actually working on your ink. And um, so that you can get the right texture on them to actually print up what's called plate. I use the same piece of material actually as a plate, but I have just slightly different processes just to get the ink on a surface that you can work from. I'm lucky enough, these were, uh, this is a sheet of material that um, our local art supply shop, Spectrum in Wexford Town, were able to source for me, although they, they only just were able to get the one. It's a great surface, it's not glass, so it's not heavy. So it's easy enough to carry loads of these around from workshop to workshop. But it's a little bit more sturdy than the other material, which is acetate, which, which I've also used. But it's more, it's this kind of surface, and it's a little bit more spray. So it's not, to me, it doesn't work quite as well. So if you look at some of the tools, you look at the plates. The rollers that I use, I use a combination. Because I do a lot of work with large groups of children, I could have Say with the large national school, I had over 50. So it was kind of 30 in one class and 20 in the next. So you need absolutely loads of rollers, and it's not always possible to have the time to use the etching press for every for every print that the children could use. But you try to get that combination of letting them explore it and see the end results. So what I plan is I need these 50 shoulders. And I think mostly for actually drawing or for actually rolling print. The reason I use a different size is I use black ink a lot. It's very hard to tell whether you actually use black or not. Mixing dry rolling and wet rolling is not a good idea. So that's the way you see. The other one I use a little bit is a little two inch short. And it is uh, useful because it, if you just want to do something like a small amount of colour onto what might be black, basically black in each, each uh, plate, is a very useful way of doing it, just with the smallest of process. So that's the rollers. And the inks that I use, the main ones that I use are um, water based. And again, there are, some of them are available in Spectrum. I also use KMM and Emphasis and Double Rot um, to do experiments. Uh, I use a basic palette of black and white and uh, the prime colours, uh, a red, yellow, and blue. But these are perfectly adequate for, um, for most workshop stuff when you're teaching people processes, and they're actually good, vibrant colours. When it came to the adults' workshop, um, people kind of felt, well, maybe give people something a little bit more adventurous to work with without having to spend loads of time fixing colours, because that wasn't really the main purpose of the exercise, it was to get people comfortable with processes. 
So I went for a slightly different colour, the crimson red, burnt umber, a Prussian blue, a turquoise, and a Viridian green. So I'm just going to pick you up again. Um, Deirdre? Yeah. Um, just, I think there's a little bit of issue with the sound. I'm not sure what it is. Um, if okay. you could come a bit closer. I keep closer. That's a little bit closer. Uh, but, yeah, what I'll do is if I go to do something at the table, I'll tell you what I'm going to be doing and then I'll bring it on. Okay? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Cool. Perfect. Okay. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to do Deirdre, if you could just note again what the paint was. Just I think people missed that with the sound. Oh, yeah, it is. Sorry. Yeah. yeah. The first three, it's actually, it's a, a, a brand thing called Brian Craig, uh, water-based, and it's definitely available in KLM Evans's, and they have an online site. It's very inexpensive. It's about five ninety five for a big, pretty big tube, and they have the full range. Spectrum locally also have some of them, um, but the basic colours, like they call it bright red, um, bright yellow, bright blue. So that's those. And I went for slightly stronger colours when it came to some of the adults workshops, just to save them a bit of time in terms of colour mixing. So I went for a crimson red as well, a burnt umber, um, a turquoise, a viridian and a Pr uh, Prussian blue. Great, thanks, Deirdre. And just to just to recap as well, the acetate plate material. What what is that? If you just again yeah, the acetate material, the one that's readily available. Um, again, I got that in Evans's. It's actually it's a heavy duty acetate. They have about three different uh, ranges of it. I always go for the the, heavy, the strongest one, which I think is eight hundred mil. But you'll see it when you go into their website. They um, they come in sheets. Um, and I think you have to buy possibly a minimum of three sheets, but each sheet you will get a plate, you get about 80 plates out of it. So they're very, very good value. And again, if you're reusing them as plates and pallets, they last you for a very, very long time. Um, so that's the, the KM Evans and stuff. This is kind of weird at this end because you've, you have all disappeared totally. Oh. <laughs> and it's a little bit disconcerting, so bear with me. Talking to yourself. <laughs> yeah, it's a, it's a strange experiment. It's strange. Is it a new one, Deirdre? I'm not sure. <laughs> <laughs> we'll survive, we'll survive. Okay. Yeah. When I talk about everyday objects, I really do mean everyday objects, okay? So just to give you a feel for the kind of stuff that's here. Um, cotton buds, uh, netting that you would have for lemon and things like that. This is slightly raised um, paper. A lot of the materials that I get, I get from Recreate in Dublin. I do a day trip up. It's a fantastic resource. It is where um, producers of, ex of goods who have excess goods um, donate them and Recreate make them available for artists and art uh, artist organizations to come and take as much as they want. Uh, you pay an annual fee for it, um, but once you've done that, you can go as many times as you want. It's pop luck what you'll get on the day, but you get some fantastic uh, materials. This again is from uh, Recreate. It's embossed wallpaper and it's very, very useful. I use feathers. Either real feathers or the kind of stuff you can buy in Deals or Mr. Price. One thing that's featured an awful lot in the adults workshops is lace. And I think it has become almost like a thing. People feel that they're incorporating something personal into the prints and mark making that they're doing. I've had people actually bring in little bits of material from christening robes, um, from curtains that they had in a house where they lived 10 years ago, that kind of stuff. And I think there's something pretty special about that, being able to incorporate something that meaningful into the, the artwork that you're making. The other kind of things are, you, you find when you get into this, the mark making with everyday stuff, that you're inclined to look at things differently. I find it hard when I'm looking at things around the house, not to see the textured surfaces. You kind of start looking at everything as a potential mark making tool. 
So things like, you know, broken little bits of plastic. Um, this thing here, I can't even tell you what it was or where it came from, it just appeared from one of the workshops. This is a little electronic component. Again, no idea where it originally came from, but it has a fantastic surface for mark making. Also, you can make your own mark making shapes. I use foam quite a lot. And um, with children, I often cut out shapes with them. I get them to draw their creatures, then get them to actually do the same drawing on a piece of foam, cut it out, and then use that shape within their print mark making. This is just a little piece of, of lino, very small piece of lino. Again, you can use the back of it, which has a textured surface, or you can actually use the front of it and draw into it and use that as a mark making tool. So that's kind of the, to give you an idea of the kind of range of stuff that you can use. The last bit is just to show you something that features very strongly in my work is grids. And um, it was part of my graduate show, I started using the backs of tiles. And I found that they were incredibly useful. I was doing Indian ink printing at the time on the large tablecloths. And you could do an awful lot painting the Indian ink onto the back of the tile and just seeing what emerged. And what emerged for me were cityscapes. And they were like maps looking, like zoom maps looking down from Google Earth or whatever. So these still are still incorporated a lot into my work, but they're more in the smaller prints now with the etching print, print ink rather than the Indian ink. But again, these, this is just, um, garden netting, different textures, different weaves, a little bit of hemp from a puffy um, sack. And this one here, which is a little bit of a lethal weapon, but it's actually a much harder grid, much stiffer. You have to be careful with it. Um, but that gives a great um, grid effect onto your prints. Okay. So the other thing I just want to share with you is um, just some examples of the surfaces that I use. So I'll just, I'll put a few quick up kind of close-ish to the screen so again, so you can see them properly. This is just for learning processes and things. I find this quite effective. It's just 130 or 160 gram card. It's really more like heavy paper but it's a fantastic surface for hand rolling um, and also for very clearly seeing what type of print is emerging without having to worry too much about dampening your Fabriano paper and get, having to use the action press. So it's a good material just to start off with. A slightly nicer version of that, I think, is this material, which is actually just wallpaper lining but it has a nice feel to it. It has a nice texture and it has a slightly off-white colour, which is, is quite nice in prints. So that's that. Again, very, very inexpensive materials. I think anything that takes away this kind of over-respect for art materials, which all of us, I think, well, maybe the ones with initial low self-esteem as artists, where you get this feeling, it's a blank sheet of paper, it's Fabriano, it cost X. How can I risk printing onto that? So this removes any of that feeling. Um, speaking of Fabriano, I absolutely love it. It's not that I don't think it's a, it's a beautiful material. It's, if you look at it here, just this beautiful textured edges to it. It has a fabulous feel and a beautiful look. So it absolutely has its place, but it's not something that I, I feel I need to use all of the time. I think I can, get very good effects and stuff on other surfaces, different surfaces. This is my thing. This is the paper tablecloth that I was talking about. It's linen effect. It is light material. You can do all sorts of things with it, crumple it, you can iron it, and you can stitch into it. Um, to me, it's just fantastic, and I really, really do hope I'm going to be able to source it again. A full tablecloth of 190 centimetres by 125 was coming in at about six euro. Um, so it really, really is a fantastic material. And again, to show some of its versatility, 
This is some of that material uh, dyed with tea. And this was the material that one of the women in the Women's Refuge group just absolutely fell in love with. And her whole story around that she put up in the teepee um, was all based on, on handwritten uh, messages and narrative from her on this type of material. But this material can also be used for ordinary ink printing. It has a good surface, a good texture for it. It can handle it well. So that's that material. And lastly, um, what myself and uh, fellow artist Breed kind of kept, we were, we were looking at the, the paper tablecloth and that and saying, well, where else can we bring this? So we were very lucky and a fellow artist, Jenny as well, had also uh, shown me some work with working on linens and things. So we also print on linen. And um, it's a little bit more difficult to get a very, very clear, crisp print. But if you're looking for something that's quite soft and something that you might want to stitch into later, this is absolutely superb. Again, we got a whole book of uh, sample linen. I think it was for some sort of household goods, but that was in recreation Dublin as well. So we got a lot of that stuff. Um, and I also used uh, in the last range of adult workshops, some slightly heavier material. I'm not, a, again, it came from Recreate, I'm not 100% sure, but I think it's like a cotton mix with something else. It's quite a strong, like a curtain type material. Um, but that, again, that's very, very effective. So um, I don't know if that's, that's enough around the kind of material side. I'm just gonna click you up again, so I don't feel lonely. <laughs> There has to be a way of doing this. Are you, are you, can you see us? I, I click it up, but it just disappears then after a couple of minutes. Well, so. rest assured we can see you. <laughs> <laughs> okay, and well, I think well. you can hear, we can actually hear you quite well now. I think Yay! everything's settled down a little bit. <laughs> okay, what I'm going to do is I'm going to, I developed this process the same with another artist called Five Ways to Draw with Ink. And what I might do is just start working through a couple of those processes. Now I'll have to step away from the camera a little bit to do some of the work at the desk. But what I'll do is I'll bring up the plate, do some of it close up, then go, go back and hand roll it and bring back up the finished product. That might be the best way to do it, okay? Yeah, that's perfect, yeah. Cool. So the first thing I'm going to do is I have rolled up um, a plate with black ink. Mm -hmm. And um, to roll up that plate, I used, as I mentioned, I used one of these sheets, first of all, as a palette. And what you do is you put a little blob of black ink in the middle of it. And what you're trying to do with the first part of the process is you're trying to get the ink on the roller to the right level so that you can actually ink up the plate. So the first time you're rolling with the ink that you've just taken out of the tube, you don't care what happens to this plate, this palette. It's purely there to get, give you an opportunity to get the ink correct on your roller. Then what you're doing is you're actually creating your plate that you're going to produce your work from. And that you need to get right. So you're taking the ink from your palette, getting, getting it right on the roller and then inking up your plate. This may have got a little bit dry, but you for do sufficiently for the purpose of showing the first process, okay? So the very first process, I'm just going to get a pencil. And I'll actually risk doing this one up at the camera. <laughs> <laughs> I've never done this at this angle before, but you can see. <laughs> so literally all I'm doing is I'm putting a sheet of the uh, initial, the, the card, the, the 160 gram card. I'm just placing it down on the, the prepared uh, plate. And I'm doing what, we, what I call bringing my line for a walk. So all I do is literally just let it go wherever it wants to go. Okay, and I'm not putting too much pressure 
on the rest of the plate. I'm just putting a little bit of pressure on it. And this is what emerges. So all you're doing literally is drawing through the back of paper onto an inked plate, but you can have an awful lot of fun with it. And with children, what I find is that this is almost like doing animation for them. They make up little books and little stories, and it's a very quick, simple, expressive way for them to get this lovely effect. We, we develop books and kind of punched holes and put, put a rope, fancy rope and, and twine and things through it. And they've gone home so proud of themselves. It's great, it's really good fun. So that's at its simplest. The other thing you can do with this is, and uh, I won't bother inking it up again, but you can put your sheet over it. And you can use some of the shapes that we talked about, that, sorry, that are cut out of the bone. This is interesting doing this standing up, but anyway. <laughs> <laughs> you can use, use your foam pieces that are, cut out, or, that are cut out from foam, and you can actually just go around the outline of them, very roughly, obviously, standing up. And we'll see. And we get our shape. So again, for, um, well, it's slightly smudged because I banged my hand against it, but I, it's a lovely contrast. You're getting loads of different grays and things in the background. It's not totally controlled. You're letting something spontaneously evolve out of it, depending on how hard you use the pencil, all of those things. So again, that can be pretty cool for kids. The next bit, I want to show you, and again, this is just another inked uh, black plate, one I prepared a little bit earlier. You, this is where the bulk of my work is, and what you're doing with this is, uh, it's a lovely method. David Begley was the first person who I saw doing this, and he very kindly, uh, always very generous in terms of his processes and things. And this kind of gave me ideas to start going off on my, on my own kind of little journey with it. But you're doing the opposite to the last, the last process. What you're doing here is rather than pressing paper against it initially, you're removing the ink first. So what you're doing is what's called wipe out or mark out. And what you're doing is you're actually removing ink to draw a picture. If you're ever in any doubt about what's going to be produced, I don't know if you can see that, Lisa? Yeah, we can, yeah. Yeah, you can hold it. You can hold it up to the light at any stage and see what's actually progressing. So it's a great way to be able to check it. I'm just going to roll the print off this now and bring it back to the camera. Mm -hmm. It was slightly dry, but that's just to show you the difference. So in this situation, what we're doing is we're creating a white line, whereas in the other method, we were creating a dark or black line. And that's the difference between the wipeout and taking the print rolling over it versus working through the back of the paper. So I just have to ink up a plate, I'm going to be a second, and then I'll show you a more kind of uh, detailed way of working with the white house. Mm -hmm. And just to recap, uh, Deirdre, KM Evans um, is the place that you buy a lot of your tools and materials? Yeah. A lot of it is because I have to buy in bulk. Sorry, a lot of it is because I have to buy in bulk. And it's handy for me to be able to get stuff delivered. Um, but I have to say, I have found Spec fantastic, incredibly helpful, and they're not particularly more expensive than Evans's or anything like that. Mm -hmm. But you have to kind of card, you know, card everything, and it's just a little bit more challenging. 
with essences. Like at one stage, I think I ordered 30 wrappings mm. um, because I just, I was starting on a school project and I knew the first three or four weeks were going to be packing. Mm. So bear with me for a sec, I'll just take up this plate. Yep. And just a quick thank you to everyone for joining us today as well. Um, the weather is really changing there now, so I don't know whether you're still getting the audio in the same in the same way as you were. Um, hopefully it's settled there for you as well. Uh, we will be making uh, the videos that you saw earlier on available online as soon as we as soon as we can. We'll make it available on our website, and um, so you'll get to rewatch those at some stage. Okay, I've just inked up another plate. One of the things with the water-based ink, and in fact the oil-based ink as well to a certain extent, in warmish weather you can't leave them very long, they dry out quite quickly. So um, even if I prepared loads of them in advance, I'd still have to ink them up again before using them. But what I want to show you is um, moving into a little bit more expressive work, if you like, using the, the inked plate. I mentioned using different tools. So this is using one of the plastic um, in, in instruments. And as I mentioned, if you use this in a slightly twisty manner, rather than just doing a straight line like with the pencil, you can often get a slightly more 3D effect. And that's actually a little bit flat because I'm not leaning down on it strongly enough. That's just another way of doing a kind of, doing a, kind of a line. I'm just going to take a little bit of lace and press it down so you can see the effect on it. So that's the effect with just pressing lace down and removing it. You're getting kind of a really interesting, it, to me it starts looking a little bit like landscapes, but that's, that's just me, you may see it as what you wish. Um, I'm going to take, take my infamous grid, which has been with me since college. And again, that's just the impact of having something that's a more kind of structured, square type shape. I'm just using a cotton wool bud. And this you kind of have to move it around. If you dab it, it just doesn't really have that much effect. And again, this one here I mentioned, this was uh, like one of the tools used for air drying clay for marking. But it has a lot of ridges on the top of it and it's very, very effective. So if I just do this kind of shape going on. So, Again, I'm just, I'm not trying to produce anything in particular. I'm just trying to show you what the various different um, utensils or tools will I can actually give you in terms of texture and structure. So I'm just going to take a rough print off that. So again, this is just to give you a feel for the type of mark making and um, the fact that the various tools, you kind of find when you're playing with them that they almost tell you what shapes uh, to create. 
um, this always seems to the cotton wool always seems to end up being the sun or a moon or something. Um, the wire always to me seems to end up being like a field of some sort. And different kind of textured land and stuff coming out. Not quite sure what this is, but very unhappy line, I think. <laughs> so that's just again just to give you feel a little bit more feel for the mark making. And um, I'm just conscious it's 20 past. Yeah. So will I keep going for another five minutes or so? Or yeah, and we have another five minutes and then we'll pause for some questions. If you don't mind, Deirdre, is that okay? Yeah, Perfect. I wanted to show adding a little bit of colour in and um, just to get, give people something that they can work forwards from with if they're interested in trying it, okay? Mm -hmm. Bear with me for a sec. So I mentioned that um, in one of the earlier pieces, I mentioned I had added a little bit of red onto um, a print. So I just want to show you the simple thinking behind it. I'm just going to put a ton of red in the plate. I'm just going to very quickly roll up the roller and show you then what I would normally do. What I'm going to do is just take a small bit of textured paper, and um, this is just kind of lightly textured, obviously with my black fingers, I'm actually a great job of this, but the, the process is what I want to show you. So I gained up a red, a little bit of red on the small roller. Just to be interested in speed, I'm not going to worry about doing a fresh plate, I'm just going to use one of the plates we just used. So. way of introducing additional colours into it. So all I did was lay the rolled piece of embossed paper or gray, with a raised surface on top of the black so it obviously it hides that out. Because it's raised paper and particularly because I'm hand rolling it rather than putting it through the etching press, you're always going to get a white area around the colour because it's raised away from the rest of the ink. And also, I had already taken a print from that ink, so I had already taken the black ink away from it. But it gives you some really, really interesting kind of combination mixes and things. And again, you might do 10 of them, and the 11th one will be something you never dreamt of, You're kind of looking at it going, wow, that's really interesting. But it is a matter of playing with the materials, I think, and actually working through to see what emerges. Mm. The last thing I'm just going to show you very quickly, and I'm not even sure if it will work too well on this, but there's a thing I mentioned earlier called a ghost print. So I'm just going to take the paper off what we just printed and see if the ghost element comes out. And if it does, it does. If not, we will not worry about it. It has a little bit. So this piece here was what our red piece was. And what happens is because you've got, 
you rolled over it, it imprints the actual embossed paper into the black ink that was originally on your plate. And when you lift it off, you get this really, really effect at the end. So again, it's just playing with adding things to your surface and taking a print and then removing them and getting it a, a quite a different print out of it. Hmm. So I think that's probably... That's, yeah, that's great. Yeah. Just um, a couple, we have about five minutes left for just a couple of questions. Um, someone has just asked, um, do you just use your fingers to press the, the lace onto the plate and also a question for me do you have any tips on how to get the ink off your hands afterwards <laughs> it can be quite the first golden rule is water-based ink okay yeah. <laughs> adults in my workshop some of them use gloves because they feel they just don't want ink on, on their fingers or whatever i can't i i just i have to feel what i'm doing it's mm -hmm. right alternatively obviously what you could do is you could use a roller and the roller is a good way of doing it too. You just, you know, keep loads of rollers, just roll it down, lift it up gently. And um, so there's a whole load of different methods. That was a little bit, you know, on the fly there, but in using a large grid, a large weave, if you like, when you press down with your fingers, you actually sometimes get fingerprints, which I find lovely. I just think there's something really, really nice about that. So that's one of the reasons I would always use fingers. But I it comes off, honestly. <laughs> <laughs> um, and dear, just from earlier on, we had a question there about the material you used to buy in the shop that's not available anymore. What material was that? That's the, the paper tablecloth. I might actually have one. Um, actually, no, I, I know what it is. It's a. It's called. Um, do it's made by Doom Cell D U N I C E L, and they're in Germany, and it's advertised as a white linen effect paper tablecloth so um, for for a throwaway tablecloth basically yeah and it, it like um i remember um in college the first time i used it the tutors were kind of saying oh my god where did you get that it's lovely and they're like it's paper tablecloth <laughs> um, but actually i had a lovely short mentoring session with the fabulous artist kathy prendergast about three years ago with through the open of paper and she actually loved them. She absolutely really, really loved them. And I kind of said, but I've been told this isn't absolutely archival material. You know, as an artist, am I mad using it? And she said her first collection of work is done on cartridge paper. Mm. And still in the exhibited and everything else, she said, it doesn't matter what you want to art. What you do, she a lot of it stays. You know? And do you find, have you found with the paper tablecloth, is there any kind of degrading of the ink? Does the ink degrade it at any length or have you? The longest, the, the longest I have it is four years and it hasn't been hanging in daylight and it's folded up and there isn't the slightest, okay. um, you know, change it. Um, and I'm sure I'll explore other materials, but it just gave me so much flexibility and so much fun. I just kind of thought this is stuck with it. And cutting it up and using it for other people has given me a lot more understanding on it as well. Mm -hmm. the stitching. And um, just to recap as well, the rigid acetate material in comparison to the flexible one, is there a difference in the name or is it just the thickness of the acetate? Well, just going back the two, this one here, the, the hard one is is actually, I don't know the name of it, and Spectrum didn't either. It's okay. something that they had in their framing storeroom. So it was literally just one sheet. So if I, if I had found the name of it, I would have gone to try and get strategies. It's, more. it's all fast like, but has a little bit more flexibility. This is actually fine. So, and I mean, this is what 90%, I'd say, of uh, print mark makers use you just take the, the sheeting off it. I need the sheeting off to protect it, but it's perfectly fine. And it's you know, I use a lot of that in children's workshops as well. Mm -hmm. But this just is more has a more solid feel, which suits me. But it doesn't, it doesn't affect the quality of the, the quality work. of the work. No, no. well, oh, thank you as well. Sorry, anybody who's interested in doing much bigger prints. Um, if you have a big enough etching press, I have quite a big etching press now. I can do up to A1 um, size. There's, there's great flexibility with these. You can cut the plate any size you want. So if I want to do something that's A2 size, 
I can cut my plate to that size, and as long as I work quickly, <laughs> and, put, and I have obviously A1 paper to print it on, or a tablecloth to print it on, it gives you that flexibility mm -hmm. to do bigger and bigger and bigger prints. Hmm. Great. Well, listen, thank you so much, Deirdre, for your talk today. Um, again, apologies about the sound on the video, guys. If anybody had any trouble, we will get the videos up online as soon as you can, and they will be available to view. Um, and Deirdre, thank you so much. I think everybody's really enjoyed your workshop and found it very inspiring today. Thank so, you very much, everybody. And again, apologies for the hopping and trotting. <laughs> but this is, this is new, to, new to a lot of us. I don't buy technology. I think it's the mix of the video on the live and trying to get that right. So but we'll get there. We'll thank get there. You so your interest. And thank you. Can I just say to anybody who wants to contact me directly, I have a problem with it. Um, it's Deirdre and Meehan Bottomer at gmail, or dmeehanbottomer at gmail.com. Um, if you have any queries and you want to come back to me. Okay? Great, thanks Good Deirdre. Time. Great, and thank you to all. Have a nice day. See you now, bye-bye. See you, see ya, bye-bye. Bye. -bye. bye. bye.